Heike Soru. They're actually a publishing company that published both books and novels. Now, what's cool about Heike Soru is that they actually translate some of the titles they publish. Now, they do have some titles that are from America and England and places like that. But some of these foreign titles are from places like Japan, Hong Kong, Russia, etc., etc., etc. So it's actually pretty cool that Heike Soru translate them. Another thing about Heike Soru is that they are actually copywritten by Viz Media. Now, for those of you that are familiar with Viz Media or heard of Viz Media, you obviously know your anime. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Heike Soru is a publishing company. And they've published a lot of titles, but I, and I have not read all of them. I only came across a few of them. But the ones that I have experienced were pretty good. Now, some of these titles become very popular. An example of that would be Battle Royale. Yeah, Battle Royale was actually published by Heike Soru. And then you got titles that actually become more prestigious. An example of a prestigious title is Brave story written by Miyuki Miyabi now this is actually a translated copy because as I mentioned Heike Soru also translate their book because the original format was written in Japanese kanji or basically Japanese writing kanji and this translated copy was translated by Alexander O. Smith now as you can see there's a gold sticker on the cover that's actually the Batch Elder Award, which was presented by the Association for Library Service to Children and also by the, Libra the American Library Association. So, as you can see, Brave Story is actually Heike Soru, well, one of Heike Soru's, you know, prestige books that they publish. Now... Brave Story is actually kind of big and it's really thick, as you can see. And I can already guess just by, well, the reaction. I can guess the reaction you guys are probably having is that, okay, what is this, a children's book? Because it looked kind of like it's aimed more for kids. Well, don't let the art style of the cover fool you. I mean... The content that's in this book kind of sway away from it being a children's book, but I'll get into that later on in the video. Now, as I was saying, this story is a little bit over 800 pages long. Granted, yeah, at the back of the book, there's a page about Miyuki Miyabi where you, the reader, actually get to know her a little bit better. Like, know who, where she's from, her education background, you know. Sort of like a better understanding of who Miyuki Miyabi is. And also at the close to the ending of the page, you have Heike Soru promoting other titles that they publish. Some of them in their original format, you know, their original language. Some that has been translated and some that is in the middle processing phase of being translated. So that's kind of cool that they promoting, you know, other titles. But... Brave Story itself, as I mentioned, is a little bit over 800 pages long. It is split into two parts. Now, in part one, we are immediately introduced to a rumor. See, there's this construction site where it's supposed to become the Daimatsu building, but what's left on that construction site is just these metal or frame of what the Daimatsu building is supposed to look like, like how tall it is, how wide it is, and stuff like that. But all it is is just that metal ore frame and wrapped in tarps. So it's already there's a rumor of it being haunted as to the reason why it haven't been finished. Now this rumor caught the attention of Wataru Mitani. Now Wataru Mitani is a stubborn, logically minded little kid. Now, here's what I mean by that. 
he if something does not make sense or if something seems kind of far fetched or just don't just seem very unclear, not factual, Wataru will question it to the nth degree. And the amount of questions that he asks shows signs of his stubbornness because he actually has two goals when he's asking these questions. One of them will be is that he's trying to find an answer that will satisfy his curiosity. His other goal and it, you know, if that goal is not comp successfully completed, then the other goal will be he just basically asking questions to sort of expose the story or comment that you made is illogical, make no sense, false, you know, so on and so forth. Basically, you know, he's just going to ask a lot of questions. That's like I said, it's, that's where his stubbornness comes in. Now. Because I mentioned that, that does not mean he's an egotistical kid, because he's not. He's kind of a bookworm. See, Wataru's background is that he's the only child of Akira and Kuniko Mitani. And like I mentioned, he's kind of a bookworm, meaning that he goes to school, you know, he enjoys learning and stuff like that. And after school, when he goes home, he'll take a little break. Then he goes to another after school like program where basically he's just learning more things to help progress him to get into a better school when he gets older. So like I said, he's not egotistical at all. He just is a bookworm and he just want to find things out. Now, because of this rumor of this construction site being haunted... Like I mentioned, this ends up having Wataru end up meeting Misuru Ashikawa. Now, Misuru Ashikawa is actually the new transfer student. He just arrived at that school. And already, he became very popular in the school. Like, all the girls think he's cute and dateable. They talk about, you know, his hair, the way he talks, all that stuff, his accent. And then all the guys in school thinks he's really cool and smart. Now, remember, Wataru's a bookworm, so he has some intelligence. And it's weird because when you get to know Wataru a little bit, you can see, okay, he's kind of smart. But whenever he's around Misuru, he becomes the total opposite of who we all know he is. Like, he becomes more... Of a clutch, you know, kind of like he make a fool out of himself. Now, it's not out of bullying, not, not, nothing to do with bullying issues at all. It's more like that instance where you see a kid that is really cool, you like, you're kind of, well, you don't admire him, but you kind of want to know him, like become friends with them. And, you know, you walk up to that kid or that person and you want to, you know, like chat with them, get to know them, try to make friends with them. But because you're nervous or you're somewhat intimidated by how they are as a person, you sort of end up accidentally making an idiot of yourself. That's kind of like what Wataru goes through whenever he's around Misuru. Now, the reason why Wataru is interested in Misuru, not because he's, you know, not just to make new friends, but... Because of that haunting rumor, there's another rumor where it involves Misru. Supposedly, when they were on a field trip, you know, his class, he does not share the same class with Wataru, but when his class went on a field trip to this holy ground that was happened to be right next to the construction site of the Daimatsu building that is supposedly haunted, he was taking pictures and supposedly he somewhat captured a picture of a ghost. That was supposedly haunting the area. And Wataru just wanted to know what the picture was. You know, he wanted to see the picture. But like I said, every time he around Misuru and he tried to start a conversation, he ends up making an idiot out of himself that made Misuru look at Wataru kind of like, you know, like, eh, I don't know about you. Now, Misuru's background 
is that he's from a very wealthy family. However, there had been a tragedy that happened in that family which caused Misaru to be more goal driven. Like every goal he made, he is driven to accomplish it, get it complete. And like I said, I don't want to give anything away, but it is mentioned in the book. But all you need to know is that Wataru, you know, he's, he's smart, he's intelligent, but he makes a fool out of himself when he's around Misru. And Misru, he's from a wealthy family. He's not egotistical himself, but he is kind of standoffish. Like, you know, when you first start reading about him, you're like, oh, okay, he's just a new kid. But at the same time, when you read about how his action and stuff like that, you can kind of see, like, okay, I could see some things here and there where it seems like he's standoffish, but he's not really trying to be. He just, like I said, goal-driven. Now, because of the situation and incidents that happened in Part 1, Part 2 follows Wataru traveling I'm trying to get to the page. Ah, right, here we go. Traveling through these land. As you can see, it says the United Southern Nation. And then there's the Northern Empire. And like I said, we see Wadaru end up leaving home and traveling those lands because I don't want to give anything away, but let's just say things went down in part one. Okay, so, but the reason why he's traveling there is kind of like out of desperation, but at the same time, trying to fix things, because he's not just traveling there just for the fun of it. He actually has a reason to be there, and one of the reasons is, you know, to follow and find his friend Misaru, and I use the word friend kind of like in the middle line, you know what I mean? It's like they're kind of friends, but at the same time, they're kind of not friends. But Wadaru sort of consider Misru as a friend. So, not only to keep catch up with Misru, but Wadaru is trying to find a person that he believes will help him either fix or save you know, the problems and situation, you know, the incident that happened in part one. So that those are his goals, you know, try to keep up with his friend Misaru and fix the problem. Throughout this, it's more like an adventure. And from there, you start meeting side characters. Well, through the whole book, there's, you know, a bunch of characters, you know, side characters that you can relate to. Or you can be like, oh, that person's cool and stuff like that, you know. And then there's some characters where you're like, you just, it seemed like that character was made there to either get to you a little bit, like, you know, that, that would just be like, wow, what an asshole. You know, get that type of reaction out of you. So, I don't want to give too much away, that's why I'm trying to keep it, you know, I'm trying to explain it without giving things away. But I, all I can say is, this is definitely, definitely a good book. I mean, once you get to the end of the book, you will see why it was awarded the Batchelder Award. Now, as I mentioned earlier about, you know, this book may seem like it's a children's book, but it's not. Here's what I mean. Brave Story covered issues or content that deals with attempting suicide, depression, desperation, self-growth, maturity, responsibility. It also deals with topics of, you know, people views on religion, cults, things like, you know, you know, so on and so forth. There's so much things that this book covers where it's like, you can obviously tell, yeah, I don't think kids will enjoy this book. I mean, they can read it, but at the same time, I would probably suggest them being more like in the mature teenage to adult group. Because, yeah, 
the way this book is inscribed. However, I mean, I'm not trying to say it's not a good book. Far from it. It's actually a really, really good book. I can see people who are into sociology could get into this book. Psychology, idealism, um, what else? Politics, religion. You know, there's so. I mean, I could highly recommend if you're into all those things. I mean, there's even a little criminology stuff contents in there. But I highly recommend, you know, if you're into all those things. Also, I will also highly recommend this book to gamers. Because believe it or not, Brave Story got some contents in there that will remind you of, you know, something from an RPG game. If you're a big time RPG fan, whether it's JRPG or regular RPG, this Brave Story, this novel... It's actually kind of awesome. They got some, you know, things there that'll make you go, hey, that seems familiar, you know, and it's kind of cool. Now, there are other representation of Brave Story, not just this novel format. There's also an anime version, which, to be honest, it's no surprise, because like I said earlier, Haikasoru is copywritten by Viz Media. Viz Media just so happened to deal with anime. So it's no surprise that Brave Story has an anime movie. Now, I haven't fully watched it. I am aware of it existing. But I will say from what my understanding is that it is enjoyable to watch. There's also video game adaptation of Brave Story. Now, there's a Japanese import called Brave Story Wataru's Adventures. And again, that's a Japanese import. However, here in America, the Brave Story game that we received was called Brave Story A New Traveler. Now, I don't know if that's supposed to be a sequel to Wataru's Adventure. I mean, from my understanding, the concept is different. But the character from the first Brave Story video game... Now, these video games... From what I'm aware of, they're for handheld devices like PSP and DS. But the character from the Wadaroos Adventure video game, there are some of them that make special appearance on the New Traveler game. But yeah, there are other adaptation of Brave Story. So if you don't feel like getting the novel. Try the anime, even though the anime will probably be more a lot shorter. But I highly recommend this novel because it's a real good read. And once you get to the end, you will, like I said, see why it was awarded the Batchelder Award. Now, from a gamer's aspect, you know, on that topic of, um, you know, Brave Story, the video game... For the new traveler, it's from what I understand it, it's like a you know American release, and like I already mentioned, the Wadaru's Adventure is for is the Japanese import, and I don't know how many copies were made, but I'll definitely you know look up and try to maybe give you guys a link to a page to see like how much they're selling for you know in case you're interested in the video game aspect, but. I highly recommend this novel. Highly, highly, highly. So, like I said, if you're into politics, sociology, psychology, um, religion, you're into cults, if you're into, you know, maybe a little bit of criminology, you know, if you're just into, you know, anything that will just keep your attention without being bored, you know, when you have those moments, I highly Highly recommend Brave Story. Well, oh, before I go, just to give you guys a heads up, the ending of the story is not a cliffhanger. But it's kind of like, if you're familiar with Pan's Labyrinth, whether the movie or the book, it will make the reader itself or the viewer, depending on if it's the book or the movie, question what they just saw or read. 
you know, question sort of like where you're trying to decipher whether or not the stuff that happened was real, like reality based or fantasy based or, you know, make logical sense or no logical sense. It's one of those type of books where it's like once you're done reading, it will definitely, definitely, you know, be like a conversational topic. You know, if you met any other people that read Brave Story, you know, so I highly, like I said, it's not, there's no cliffhanger in this. The ending is actually a good ending. It's not like a to be continued type deal. It's very satisfactory. It's just that it will leave you thinking a lot. Which is really cool. I like, you know, books like that. So, yeah, as I was saying, highly recommend Brave Story. And, like I s hope you guys enjoy. Alright then, later.